Welcome to Scary Savannah and Beyond. This will be episode number 29. It's a uh, kind of like a insignificant number, right? It's like right before 30. Yeah. That's like the last year of your 20s. It's like... I remember those days. Yeah. Back in the days. Yeah, it's been a minute. Not like the way I just turned somewhat in my 40s, right? Yeah, well, sort of. Sort of in my 40s, yeah. That's <laughs> where I'm at right now. So you can find us on social media if you go to any platform and look for the user at Scary Savannah. We want to tell everybody to go check out our giveaway. Go to our website, look for the giveaway tab, and there's very easy instructions to go win a cool shirt like the one I'm wearing or a coffee mug like the Layla and Coffee Talk mug or the original we scary switched it up tonight savannah and beyond it's because i have this nasty coffee drink that we that I bought <laughs> thinking it would be good yeah. and it's not and she don't like it and i don't like it you and said you liked it that's why i gave it to you when it was cold but now it's room temperature and it's disgusting and i hate it so well, there's a coffee coke in the fridge for you if you want it well i'm drinking a five hour energy right now so i think i don't need to go ahead and mix all three of these things together because i might just transcend reality and i don't think we're ready for that on episode 29 this could be really cool though it could be really cool I want to see this i want to see i've ever been really cool in my whole i want to see you on a five hour energy a vanilla coffee coke zero sugar and whatever that monster thing and I've a got. monster cold brew <laughs> nitro yeah <laughs> has words on it that make you think it's supercharged yeah so how have you been this week crystal <laughs> getting pumped on that energy yeah i need some energy it's late we were going to get started earlier today and by earlier it was later later it was later <laughs> much later much later but it's still earlier than we probably would have done it on a previous episode when we had to go to the other studio. Probably. But I've been good, and we're about to celebrate your birthday. Yeah. Actually, we just celebrated it uh, right before this episode drops, I guess. So, yeah. I mean, technically, while we're recording, it's going to be tomorrow. Yeah. But then when they see this, it will be over. And who knows? By that point, I may have something really cool, like a flamethrower. Yeah, had you mentioned this sooner, I would have definitely gotten you a flamethrower. I don't need a flamethrower. That's the last <laughs> thing I need because I've, uh, I'm have i a pyromaniac. You know, I like to burn things. You do? You should know this about me. I almost burned my house down. Oh, well, that's true. Yeah, it was not a pretty picture, but thankfully my dad believed the story about a guy driving by and throwing a cigarette. Throwing a cigarette on the pompous grass. Yeah, and it just burnt that up. And, you know, I guess I was a good liar. And we have Beach Bomb coming up this Friday, which is the only parade that you like. I do like that parade, and I hate every other parade in the history of parades. Yeah, but it's been a couple of years since they've done Beach Bomb, so we're looking forward to that, and we'll hopefully get some pictures if they don't douse my phone with water. That'll be fun. Yeah, it's supposed to be water resistant, right? Yes, resistant being the key word. Yeah, they like aim for it if they see your phone in your pocket or anything. They have no mercy. They don't, so... If my phone survives, you'll see footage. This week, we are going to be going back to Savannah, and we're going to be telling you about three more haunted locations that you can find in this great haunted city. So, Crystal, why don't you go ahead and tell us about some of these things? Okay, first up is the Eliza Thompson House. It's located in the historic district at 5 West Jones Street. The Eliza Thompson House is today a beautiful historic bed and breakfast featuring 25 guest rooms. And it, like I said, it's on Jones Street. That's an historic street in Savannah named for Major John Jones, who was an aide to Brigadier General Lachlan McIntosh. Remember him? I do remember Lachlan. He's buried at the Colonial Park Cemetery. We got to go back yeah. there. We haven't been there in a while. So he was his aide at the 1779 Siege of Savannah during the Revolutionary War. Jones Street stretches just over a mile from West Boundary Street in the west to East Broad Street in the east. It lies near the center of the historic district. Jones Street is truly one of the most beautiful streets in Savannah. I concur. Mm -hmm. We love walking down it and exploring all the interesting architecture and live oaks. It's been called one of America's most charming streets. And I think I'm going to try to put a picture up of it so that you can take a look and see what it looks like. Yeah, we're going to Savannah next week, so we'll probably check it out. We would definitely check it out. The Eliza Thompson House dates back to 1847 and was the first one built on Jones Street. This year, 2022, marks its 175th 
birthday. They should come out with some sort of commemorative coin. You know how <laughs> these offshoot places that try to pretend yeah. like they're the treasury, like here's the silver anniversary coin yeah. you can own yeah. and it's got Jones Street on it. <laughs> Someday it may increase in value and be worth at least $2. The home was built for a cotton dealer named Joseph Thompson and his wife, Eliza, along with their seven children. They were one of Savannah's first high society couples, and they often threw lavish dinner parties for Savannah's well-to-do. Don't you wish you could have been at oh, one of yes. those parties? I would so be there smoking a cigarette and one drinking a cocktail. One of those cigarette holders yes. in one hand, and you have a cocktail in the other. And you and a sit satin there and dress. Like, <laughs> yes. I, would have, I would have loved it. Yeah. The house was built in two stages with a second addition added in 1870. The entrance today was the original side porch and was enclosed to create the front parlor and two rooms. What is a parlor? It's like a sitting area, living room Do without the TV. Do they still put parlors in houses? Not in modern houses, but in historic houses, yes, you still have a parlor. Like when we stayed at the uh, Foley house, when we went in and the Christmas tree was in there, that was the parlor. That's a parlor? That's a parlor. So it's basically like a dining room. No, you just sit around and talk. That's horrifying. There's no, <laughs> no phones or anything. No phones, Imagine. no TVs, no radios. Imagine. Just ghosts. They might have had one of those phonographs. That would be amazing. Yeah. Or a piano. So the home also had an attached carriage house. Joseph, in addition to being a cotton dealer, was also a developer and was instrumental in planning new homes that were built in the area. He served on several bank boards financing the building of new homes. We're going to show you a picture of him. He's Here he really, is, right really here. Cool. He was also a member of the Georgia Hussars, a precursor to the Georgia National Guard. Hussar! Hussar! He died in March of 1855 at the age of 57, just eight years after their mansion on Jones Street was completed. Eliza took over managing her husband's affairs, which was not common at the time. Usually they'd turn it over to lawyers and such, but she wanted to do it herself. And she continued throwing her lavish parties until her death in 1875 at the age of 71. She just wanted to have them parties rolling. <laughs> yeah, she liked the party. She looks like a partier. Yeah. Joseph and Eliza are buried in the Laurel Grove Cemetery along with one of their daughters. We know where that is. Yeah, we're going to check that out next time we go. We probably saw their graves and just didn't know that's who they were. Yeah, it doesn't say which daughter. They had seven children, but uh, I saw that one of the daughters died at age 24, 23 or 24, depending on her birthday. I think I sort of remember seeing these graves. Remember there was a cluster of graves mm -hmm. together? I don't know if it was there, this one. These, I've seen them and they're pretty flat and like the headstones are only like... Kind of a little curve. Okay. Well, we're going to take our EVP device and go see if we can talk, talk to, to them. Eliza. See how she likes her bed and breakfast these days. So the couple's firstborn sons were Joseph Jr. and James, who were twins. They were born in 1825. Joseph Jr. died at age nine from a fever epidemic. James grew up and served in the Confederate Army. However, at age 36 in 1861, he was kicked in the stomach by his horse in nearby Forsyth Park. He was taken into the home on Jones Street where he died. Wow, that'd be a horrible way to go. Yeah. This may explain the frequent sightings of a Confederate soldier sitting in the upstairs window. Two of Eliza and Joseph's daughters lived in the home until the early 1920s when they sold it to a doctor. He lived in the house and had his doctor's office downstairs. In the 1950s, the home was sold to a dentist. They say that under the carpet in the parlor, you can still see small indentations where he secured his equipment to the ground. Want some nitrous oxide? <laughs> yeah, that's all I can think of. Suit yourself. In 1977, the home was purchased by Jim and Mary Wildman to be converted into a bed and breakfast. The original carriage house was decrepit, so they tore it down and had it rebuilt in its original footprint, which added 13 rooms to the property. I can't believe the city of Savannah let them do that. Yeah. In 1995, Stephen Carroll Day bought the property and gave it a $200,000 facelift. Pocket change. Yeah, that was even more money back then. They, can you calculate it? It was probably about 75 to 35 cents. <laughs> exactly. They had a 40-foot container of antiques shipped from England to furnish the inn. A lot of these pieces are still there today. So it probably came over on one of those cargo ships. Just like the ones we see. Yeah. Out here on the ocean. Yep. Because it was the 70s. No, this was 1995. 95? You were listening. You know I don't listen. <laughs> or reading the script where it's right in front of your face. I'm so busy looking at your beautiful eyes. <laughs> in February of 2002, the Eliza Thompson house was purchased by its current owners, HLC Hotels, which is a locally owned hotel management group. 
Today, the home is part of a collection of inns called Historic Inns of Savannah, and this includes the Marshall House, East Bay Inn, Old Harbor Inn, the Gastonian, and the Kehoe House. Oh, there's one. The Kehoe House. Yeah. Some of those are haunted. We know the Marshall House is, and East Bay and Old Harbor, I definitely want to stay at. We've seen, we're going to do an episode about that. I'm not sure about the Gastonian. I haven't you heard know of that one. everything is haunted. I don't even have to say what you know I'm about to say. McDonald's is oh, haunted. Oh, no. <laughs> we're not going back to McDonald's. We're going to McDonald's on Broughton, and I'm going to is order. Is that where we're eating dinner? Yeah, for my birthday. For your birthday? Yes. Today, the bed and breakfast features 25 rooms, all with names, is as typical in inns around here. The R. Bruce room and the Lindsay rooms were the home's original bedrooms. The Lee room used to serve as the Thompson's nursery. The original kitchen is now the Oglethorpe room, with its massive fireplace and the original pot hanger used for holding pots on the fire still visible. It is just beneath the St. Julian room, and the dumbwaiter would have been used by the cook to send food up to the dining room. That's pretty cool. That like, sounds very old very school. Very fancy. Very fancy. You could sit there and smoke your cigarette and drink your cocktail while as my, your dumb waiter while, comes up with <laughs> your, my food's delivered. While your food service. If you want to stay in the most haunted room at the Eliza Thompson house, you know then I do. you need to request room 132, the R. Bruce room. This room features a creepy painting of Joseph Thompson, and many guests report seeing the ghost of the Confederate soldier, presumably James Thompson, standing in the window of this room. After staying in this room, a guest wrote a letter to the owners describing his experience. The following is his account. While I was trying to fall asleep, I heard a little girl joyfully and gleefully laughing, having fun. The voice was definitely of a young child. It was very happy, gleeful, joyful, and playful. That is the key word, playful. And what was unique about this voice was that it was distinctly heard within my room. Come from outside, it didn't come from a single direction. It didn't come from, say, the doorway or the hallway. It didn't come from, say, a vent or from the roof or from below or from outside the window. It was dynamic within the room. This was rather disturbing. And I wasn't frozen paralyzed, but I was tense and stayed still in bed. I listened to the laughing and I thought, oh my gosh. And I listened to it some more. I thought, please, please, I just want to go to bed. I continued to try to go to bed, but then I heard a second bout of long, continuous laughter. And this time, a voice clearly said, daddy, 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 daddy. It was spoken in the same voice and in the same joyful way. And as it was said, I felt pressure like two little open hands pressing repeatedly on my back as if to get me to get up and play. I was shaken on each daddy as if to get my attention and get me up and out of bed. I knew that only my wife and I were in the room and I had not fallen asleep during this experience. I know no one other than my wife and I was in that room before going to bed. When I went down in the morning for breakfast, I just noticed the statues of little girls. And at this point, I had to ask the woman at the reception if the house was haunted. Yeah, so he claims to have heard little girls or little kids. And this is worth noting that like a lot of bed and breakfast in Savannah, this one is also 21 plus. So there should have been no children staying in the inn, especially in this guy's room. So do you think it's the spirit of one of the Thompson children or maybe a patient from the doctor's office? Who knows? It could possibly be something completely different, like the massive Indian burial grounds apparently stuff are on here. Who knows? <laughs> so I went to TripAdvisor and found some accounts of other people's experiences at the Eliza Thompson house. Victoria B. wrote, and the title is Ghost Child or Cheese Dream. <laughs> I like that. You don't even need to say anything else, really. First off, the J. Stephen room is beautiful, clean, and spacious. Second, it might be haunted, but I was never creeped out. I felt something press across my chest. It felt like the weight of a small child planking across me. At first, I was like, whatever. Then it got heavier and heavier. I told it to get off of me three times. The third time, it got really heavy and vanished. I woke up, and it was 3.33 a.m. The next morning, my husband said I woke him up mumbling around that time. 
It could have been a ghost or a nightmare. It could have been either. It <laughs> sounds very similar to what happened to you at the Marshall House. Yeah, except that I couldn't breathe. Yeah, it would, was a little bit more terrifying yeah. for you, I imagine. So this one is by Four Brooks 92 Host was a ghost. If you're into ghosts slash paranormal, then this is your place. Night one, I had my headset on because I was restless. I heard a noise like something fell. I took my headset off and heard either wind or a sigh to my left. The room was completely dark, so I grabbed my cell and took three photos from left to right. Only as a light source to see where the noise came from. I saw nothing. About 20 seconds later, I took two more because I was uneased. The next morning, I looked at the pictures. You can clearly see a white mist enter the room, cross in front of the fireplace, then hover over the bed. The pics I took 20 seconds later, nothing. The pics are time-stamped 3.20 a.m. So it sounds like these ghosts have an affinity for the 3 o'clock hour. Yeah, they like to stay up late. <laughs> Partying. <laughs> Watching forensic files, maybe. They could be. Punkster Jess 87 wrote, Seeking adventure? Stay in the R. Bruce room. I would also like to mention for fellow ghost seekers that this hotel is most definitely haunted by a kind, curious ghost. On our first night stay, there was a thunderstorm that came through and had slightly kept us awake, but it was also our alarm clock CD player that unexpectedly went off around 3 a.m., <laughs> just like you said, that got us a little startled. We waited the second night to see if it would happen again, and it didn't. However, the second night, I was awoken by my sheets being pulled down slowly from over my head. Over their head. Sounds like they're following rule two for my rules of ghost engagement. Yeah. My boyfriend lay silently sleeping, so I knew it was not him. Sounds like me. Yeah. (laughs) The next day, we had mentioned these two events to Aaron, who kindly listened and didn't deny the fact that these things often happen and that our room was in fact haunted. Please don't let my story deter you away from staying here, but know that this room was so peaceful and gave us great joy and rest during our two-night stay here. I hope to visit Savannah again in the near future and will happily request this room again on our next stay. The Eliza Thompson house was also featured in an article by South Magazine entitled Fright Night. That makes it sound like a comfy, cozy place that everybody can have joy and peace. (laughs) The following is their account of a paranormal investigation conducted by Charleston Paranormal. Charleston Paranormal captured their first disembodied voice or audible capture in real time at the Eliza Thompson house. Quote, while making a sweep around our room, I was asking, is anyone here? Said Julie DeMora, co-owner of Charleston Paranormal. When I came to a closet, I asked, what about in here? And a full two seconds after I opened it, we noticed that a couple of coat hangers began to move. I immediately tried to replicate it by opening the door quickly to create as much air current as possible but could not duplicate it. Just then, a voice answered in the air behind me. I am, end quote. That's creepy. Yeah. Can I say that now? Yes. That's creepy. Charleston Paranormal stayed in the Admiral Turner Room and the Johnston Room, and although the voice was heard in the Admiral Turner Room, the Johnston Room proved to be just as chilling after they called a full-bodied apparition crossing the doorway into their room. Using a spirit box, Demora asked, Who was that? And received a response of, it's me, in a woman's voice. Oh, it's just no little me. <laughs> it's mean. Eliza. I'm having a party. See, this could be scary because it just says, it's me. Now, did yeah. it say, it's me? Or did it say, it's me? Well, it's a woman's voice. It probably wasn't like that. I'm sorry. It's me. <laughs> probably. Delta Park. <laughs> Delta Park. Zelda Rubenstein. <laughs> so, yeah, this place sounds like it's definitely haunted. We should go stay there. I think so. Yeah. We'll be we there next week. request the R. Bruce room. Yeah, definitely. So we're going to be in Savannah next week, so we'll at least go get some pictures of the outside. We'll so stay we already there. have a place we're staying. And since you don't sleep, you'll be awake at 3 a.m., and then you'll see if a ghost shows up. True. I'll be asleep. I'll have my phone out ready to record. And my EVP device. Yeah. So the next stop on our haunted tour of homes is going to be the Hampton Lillibridge House. I like that name. This story is about an unassuming house located just west of Washington Square. Is Washington Square one of those little ones? Yes, it is. Yeah, I think we've been there. It's like, is it the outskirts? It's it's close to the Pirate's House. Yeah, that's what I thought. So it's on the east side of the historic district. At the very end. This structure doesn't look like most of the other houses that you're going to see on our haunted houses list. 
it looks very much like a home you would see in the Northeast United States. And this does make sense, as when it was built in 1796 for Hampton Lillibridge, it was made to match his hometown styling. So his name was Hampton Lillibridge? Yes. I assumed it was like Two his people. last name, yeah, Hampton, because like that's usually what they do, like Mercer Williams. Yeah. It sounds like a law firm, doesn't it? Yeah, Thompson. The Hampton Thompson. Lillibridge <laughs> firm is here for you. Have you been in an automobile accident? We don't get paid unless you win. <laughs> We're probably going to get sued for using a tagline. <laughs> Good times. So Hampton Lillibridge was from Rhode Island, so it makes sense that the house is styled based on his tastes because that's where he's from. And I'm going to show you a picture of the house so you can see it. When Lillibridge died, his wife sold the house and the new owner turned it into a boarding house. And this is usually how most of our stories start. They take a building and turn it into some place where people can come stay and get haunted. Exactly. One of the early stories that seemed to have started it down its haunted past is that of a sailor. He was apparently in a deep state of despair as it goes that he actually completed suicide by hanging himself in one of the guest rooms. This naturally led to the property being marked as a place of ill repute. You know how we've read stories about the sailors at the pirate's house and such. So Yeah, usually there are other things associated with the house of ill repute. Well, they call it boarding house, so I imagine things happen there. Oh, well, I thought boarding house just meant you lived there. You... Live there by the hour? Maybe. <laughs> I didn't do that much investigation into it. Okay. I'll try to find out if yeah, it was, you know, know, more of a brothel. Yeah. See, it doesn't say a brothel. It says a boarding house. So. No, that's what they said. But I just okay. pictured Maybe it that as a was bunch of sailors out it. there just like, you know, dressed up like pirates because that's what I see as sailors. I don't know what year this happened, but it had to be a long time ago. Okay. Years later, the boarding house closed and the property set vacant for quite a time after that. That usually seems to happen, too. That makes it more haunted. Mm -hmm. What really set this house off as haunted came much later. In 1963, Jim Williams, who many may know from what we around here call the book, the Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil book, purchased the house. Jim Williams was an antique dealer, and he was known for restoring properties in Savannah to their previous splendor, because at this point, a lot of the historic district was run down, yeah. and he played an instrumental part in renovating and restoring a lot of mm -hmm. structures back to their former glory. Mm -hmm. We're actually going to be doing a special episode about Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. And we'll tell you more about him then. Yeah, I can't wait. I love that book. That's going to be a big one for us. Yeah. One story that I found is that in the process of restoring the house, part of the structure collapsed and crushed one of his laborers to death. Oh, mm, no. I don't know if that's verified or not, but that's the story. <laughs> this occurred when the house was being moved to its current location. And that's just one more event to chalk up to its haunted reputation. Once the building was moved, Williams' crew started experiencing more paranormal activity. They reported tingling sensations on the backs of their necks. They would hear furniture being moved. Sounds of voices and footsteps could be heard as well, but their source obviously couldn't be found, but they knew they were hearing something. Much like Moon River, tools were known to turn on by themselves. And also like Moon River... The strange and unexplainable experiences caused members of the crew to quit the job. Eventually, Would you keep working if, no. like, your power saw just turned itself on? No, I mean, you didn't have to finish that sentence. You <laughs> said, would you keep working? I mean, no, nope. I'm done. So when you go to restore that coffee table in the garage. If, if the, a coffee table starts talking to me. If uh, the sander just starts turning on by itself, or are we moving? We're moving. Well, I've already okay. told you how this works. This okay. is why I don't turn on the EVP in our house. Okay. Eventually, word of all these events got out, and a local news crew decided to go and try to investigate. Oh, is that serious, huh? It was. When they went in, supposedly a piece of construction material flew with them. Now, that sounds like something that would have been documented, and you could have found it if a it local news crew did that. It could have just fallen off of 
out of a shelf or something. Did it fly across it the room? It sounds like it was flung at them. And well, they weren't videoing it this time, I guess. Apparently not. Mm. And it also could have Darn just it. been a homeless person. True. That I don't know if they had that many of those in the 60s. I don't know. Yeah, we got a good population of them now, don't tell no. I couldn't find any supporting evidence that this actually even happened, but it seems like it would have been shared on the news or there could have been history of it. Mm -hmm. Maybe I just didn't look hard enough, but it does make for a great story, doesn't yeah, it? It does. After all of this happened, not all of Williams's crew left. Some of them did remain on the project because they were sturdier men than I. <laughs> One of these remaining workers had an experience with a ghost, and it's said that he heard a loud noise on the site and went upstairs to investigate. As no one should have been up there, it was assumed that perhaps something had just fallen off of a shelf or a ladder collapsed and made the noise, something explainable. Mm -hmm. He didn't return immediately, and after a while, some concerned co-workers went to check on him. They found him prone on the floor in a state of shock. He said that when he walked into the room, he immediately felt like he'd been thrown into freezing water. You know how you get that feeling when you're in a dream or in water and you can't yeah. move with the speed you want to move, like when you're in a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. He claimed that he felt like something was trying to take control of him. Oh, wow. Possibly possessing him. Wow. He also said that the force was trying to drag him towards an open chimney shaft, which would have resulted in a three-story drop to the ground, wow. which is why he was face down on the floor. He's trying to stay there. He's trying to not be drug off yeah. into the chimney shaft, which would have likely been a fatal experience for this man. When he was recounting this story, one of his fellow workers suggested that maybe an exorcism should be attempted. I think it was sort of a casual, like, you know, they probably didn't believe Next logical the man. Step. Yep. And supposedly, as soon as the word exorcism was spoken, a woman's scream pierced the room and everyone that was in the room heard it. Wow. Another thing the workers claimed to experience was the presence of a tall man dressed in black. And he was said to peer at them from a third floor window. Another ghost that had been sighted by the workers there was that of a middle-aged man wearing a silver robe. Now, that could have been a homeless guy. Yeah. Neighbors would complain of noises from the house, much like partying, although the residence was empty at the time. Others claimed to see people dancing on the third floor, all the while the building was empty. Lights would flicker in the house. Got to have the haunted house staple of flickering lights, right? Definitely. So was the uh, Hampton Lily Bridge dude. Did he throw a lot of parties? Back in the day. I did not see anything of that nature. Probably did if he's high society. There wasn't very much about him personally, honestly, mm -hmm. which I found strange. Well, if there's one thing you can count on. If he had money, he threw parties. And he probably threw them frequently. Yes. That's and what you do. he probably had the highfalutin, high-to-dos going across town from one house to the other. Yeah. Just they partying. went from Eliza's house down to Hampton's and then back up to... Um, the third one we're going to talk about. Yes, the third one. Ain't going to give it away yet, but they also are known for parties. We'll get to that. It seems like they were all known for yeah. parties. A woman who lived near the residence confessed to Williams that she had been feeling a male presence that had been tied to the house, and it wasn't a happy feeling she was feeling. One thing that may have been the source of all these issues, the renovation of the house on its new location had revealed a crypt. Oh, wow. It seems like you would have checked that before you put a house there. Turns out there's a crypt here. Well, of course, it is Savannah. It is so. Savannah. It's probably Where just are, like, you uh, can put a house that there isn't a crypt. Well, there's only one crypt. Yeah. That's sort <laughs> we of We lucked out. <laughs> yeah, we were, we're really not even nearly as cursed as we could have been. Yeah. <laughs> this crypt was very old, and it was thought to be pre-colonial. It was seemingly Native American in origin as the walls of the crypt were constructed from rough lime and crushed oyster shells. And you know what they did with this finding? Probably just built the house on top anyway. Exactly. Nothing. <laughs> they just reburied the crypt and well, left it as out of sight, is out of mind. the house. <laughs> Apparently, Williams didn't put much stock into these stories. If you learn more about yeah. him, you'll sort of see his character. Now, I don't know how much of what you read in the book is true to him because it's really the majority of that book is a fictional story. Mm -hmm. 
but he did base it off of their personalities as he knew from other people telling him. But you get the picture that Jim Williams was not a kind of guy that probably could have been bossed around easily. Yeah. And even after all these events happened, he still moved into the Hampton Lillibridge house. He ain't afraid of no ghosts. Apparently not. But skeptic though he was, even he began to experience things. Mm. He claimed to be woken by footsteps in the night, and these weren't the footsteps of little kid ghosts like we hear about in other places. Said it sounded like glass being crushed. It was Mm -hmm. pretty ominous sounding to me. He also claimed to see a shadowy figure. It began to approach him, and in true ghost fashion, it vanished. One story says that he chased an apparition down a hallway until it slammed a door in his face. So he tried to follow it and went for the door, and it turns out the door is locked. So the ghost sounds like it was scared of Jim Williams. I don't know. (laughs) But that was enough for Jim. He wanted to be rid of whatever it was because he considered it to be an annoyance. He enlisted the help of an Episcopal bishop from a local church, Reverend Albert Rhett Stewart. He conducted an exorcism on December 7th, 1963, and the reverend demanded the spirits leave and rest in peace. His efforts did seem to work for a few days. (laughs) Very soon after a period of silence, which lasted for a few days, the disturbances picked back up. Maybe they had just gone on vacation to the beach. Yeah, they're like, we're going down to Tabby. We'll be back in a few days, reverend. We're going to go have a big party. (laughs) After this, Williams tried to get help from a variety of paranormal investigators and other organizations to see if they could do anything to help remove the troublesome spirits from his house. Everyone agreed that there was activity in the residence, but no one could assist in removing the offending spirits. Savannah ghosts don't leave easily. Apparently not. They don't. Seems like they like where they They are. They like their parties. Eventually, Williams sold the property, and even today it is a private residence. And as I've read, the current owners are not too fond of all the attention their house gets from local tour companies. So we shouldn't go knocking on the door next week? We should not. Oh, man. We can, however, stand across the street and take pictures. Okay. Do you think this place might be haunted? It's literally the only place in Savannah that has a documented exorcism. Yeah, I think it's definitely haunted because everything is. And I don't think Jim Williams is the kind of guy to make stuff up for no reason. I mean, he's not, he wasn't into like ghosts. So, yeah, I think that it probably could be haunted based on these stories. But it turns out that the current owners of the house actually say that they have never experienced anything. Well, you know, some people just don't, even if it is, you know, spirits there, some people just, it doesn't affect them, I think. That could be the case. Some, some people, people can are walk a little more through, sensitive yeah, to some it. Some people can walk through a place and feel nothing, see nothing, hear nothing. Like me. And then others hear and see all kinds of stuff. So I guess Pete, some people are more sensitive yeah. to this kind of stuff than others. Yeah. Maybe or the ghost maybe be sitting the ghost there shaking just... my shoulder be like, wake <laughs> up, I'm trying to haunt you, and I'm just snoring. And, yeah. And you, meanwhile, you're over in the corner like cowering from yeah. a water bug. <laughs> Not the ghost, a water, a water bug. bug. <laughs> You'd be scared of the water bug. You'd be like, can you step on that thing for me while you haunt him? Exactly. Our third and final destination tonight is the Hamilton Turner Inn. You may have seen this house featured in the movie Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, which, like Brett said, we'll be doing an episode on eventually. This beautiful Second Empire, or French Baroque revival style mansion. That's my favorite kind of revival style. Yeah, French I, Baroque. I had to add French Baroque because Second Empire wasn't clear. So well, I, it's also known as French Baroque, okay. which I knew you'd be very familiar with. I'm glad you clarified yeah. because if you had just said Second Empire, I'd have yeah. been like, but which one? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's known by a few different things and this is the most concise. Let me drink some more of his nasty coffee. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was built in 1873 for Samuel Pugh Hamilton, who was nicknamed the Lord of Lafayette Square. I bet he threw a lot of parties. Oh, he did. Situated at 330 Abercorn Street. The home overlooks beautiful Lafayette Square and is nicknamed the Grand Victorian Lady. This house has a long history of parties and revelry. I wonder if people back at the time talked sort of in slang like we do now, but we're going to go hit up the GVL, have us a party at the Grand Victorian Lady, (laughs) the GVL. I don't think so. And then Hampton Lillibridge is like, you know, we're going to be up in that place. No, that's not how they talk. That's how I picture it. They talk like proper Southern oh. gentlemen and ladies. Okay. 
We shall visit the home of the Grand Victorian Lady. Yeah. Well, now you're going into like an English accent, sort of. Because that's how we talked. <laughs> Samuel Hamilton and his wife, Sarah, who was actually his brother's widow, figure that one out. He killed the guy for the house. No, he built this house. For his wife, He's which really was his brother's wife. He's just trying to throw us wife. off with that second revival stuff. <laughs> he said Baroque. Baroque. <laughs> <You> Baroque. <laughs> so he had been married before and his wife died and then his brother died. So he married his wife. Sounds like Leviticus. So it's like uh, the original Brady Bunch sort of. But I've never seen that show. But even more weird. Which I've never seen anything. You've never seen the Brady Bunch. I know it exists. I've seen so it the was movie. a dad, and the he had three was boys. Better anyway. And the mother had three girls, and they had to make a family, so they got married. They were both divorced, which was quite a thing in the 1970s. Makes sense. Yeah, Samuel and his wife Sarah moved into the home with their six children and entertained the elite society of Savannah. In 1883, the home was the first in the city to have electricity. They were throwing raves back in the 80s. Hamilton was involved with the Brush Electric Light and Power Company, so it stands to reason he would be on the cutting edge of technology. It's said that people would gather nightly outside the house to see the lights come on. Exciting. Can you imagine? I know. That it's like, together. that's exciting. It's sort of like the first time we discovered how life-changing a DVR is. Yeah. It's life-changing. It is. And, and now everybody just takes it for granted. Yeah, I remember getting a DVR. I remember it specifically. I remember, I remember getting a VCR. Oh, I do too. It was First like a thousand dollars back then. Was labyrinth. We had to finance one when I was a kid. Like you had to get monthly payments because it was so expensive. I think we stole one. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We didn't <laughs> we steal didn't one. Stole that, that was what your uncle did. Yeah, that was a TV, and that was a different story. <laughs> <laughs> They spared no expense to make their home the epicenter of entertainment. Besides electricity, the home featured some of the latest inventions to be implemented, like tin roofs, skylights, and even indoor plumbing. You know what I see when you talk about them coming to see the lights? I what? just see it as a grand display, like when Clark lights up. But it was probably literally <laughs> like one, one, one bare hanging from the ceiling. Bulb, yeah. and they're like, it really was like they only had lights in the downstairs, like a few lights. Originally, it took like four or five more years until they got, every, you know, the whole thing lit up. And every night they yeah. came to see the <laughs> one night. light bulb. <laughs> every night. Then they partied like it was 1899. The mansion managed to survive the Great Fire of 1898 that destroyed nearby Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. Mm. They have since rebuilt this and it's spectacular. We'll, we'll post some pictures the of it. church beside the graveyard? Yes. The cemetery? Yes. Or is it a graveyard? It's a cemetery. It's not attached to a church. Even though it's beside... Well, it's not It's not part of that church. The church. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that place is amazing. It is quite impressive. If you've ever in Savannah, you're going to have to come see you the... You can't miss it. Yeah. Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. It towers over the entire city. No mm -hmm. matter where you're at in the city, you can pretty much see the spires of this cathedral just sticking up. And multiple times a day, you're allowed to go in it if they're not having services. Not and having, it's just They call it mass, I think. Well, yeah, but it's it's really neat to see. It is a see. Catholic church. I know so. it's a Catholic church. Well, I know you know that. I'm telling everybody. <laughs> I know because it says St. John the Baptist. You might think it's a, a Baptist, but it's a cathedral, so it's, it is a, it's Catholic a Catholic church. church. The Hamilton Turner Mansion survived the fire due in part to its Connecticut limestone roof. This prevented the home from being engulfed in flames. Hamilton was also an avid art collector and turned his home into a private art museum. When Samuel Hamilton died in 1899, his wife went on for many more years entertaining in the home before her death. They are both buried in Bonaventure Cemetery. The Hamilton family sold the home to Dr. Francis Turner in 1915, hence the name Hamilton Turner. Makes sense. The doctor lived in the mansion with his family until 1926. Dr. Turner then opened the home as a boarding house. And this is where things go south. For nurses in 1928. This is during the First Great War. WWI. Yeah. And then in the 1940s, the Turner family moved back into the house and continued to see patients in the home office. It's also reported that he performed autopsies in the basement. For added shock value. Yes. He had. He was like, you know, someday this place is going to be talked about. I got to do something outside the box. Turns out I autopsies. wasn't even a doctor. I just do <laughs> autopsies. Hey, have you seen my light bulb? 
1965, the Turners sold the property to the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. Their plan was to demolish the mansion and build a playground. Wow, that sounds so like something they would do. I know. Luckily, the historic Savannah Foundation stepped in and saved the home from demolition. The house sat vacant for years during the 1960s before becoming an apartment complex, and later in 1997, it was restored to its former glory and turned into a luxury bed and breakfast. Which is all the steps a house takes to become a haunted house. This place is spectacular inside. You have to see pictures of it. So I told you that the house was talked about in the novel Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil and later featured in the film, but did you know that it may have been the inspiration for Disney's Haunted Mansion. I've been in the Disney's Haunted Mansion, and I can tell you for a fact I have no idea why they're similar. (laughs) The Hamilton Turner home was rumored to be an early inspiration behind Walt Disney's Haunted Mansion, based off the first designs of Harper Goff in the 1950s. Do we have pictures? Yes. I'm putting them up. The house's French Gothic architecture and natural creepiness makes the Haunted Mansion rumor unsurprising. Oh, yeah, I see it now. Susie Riddler... The inn's general manager said, I've heard the rumor before, but I don't know whether it's true. I can see the similarities between the Haunted Mansion and the Hamilton Turner House, but the one thing that was actually really similar is the fountain outside each of the houses. Further, a CNN Eye report claims that Walt Disney himself sat on a bench in front of the Hamilton Turner Mansion and sketched it. That would be an amazing thing to have. One source adds, Walt Disney did briefly consider Hutchinson Island, an island off Savannah's coast, as a location for Disney World, but apparently it wasn't quite big enough for his dreams. Don't think it would have panned out for Disney if Can that's how they started. Can you imagine? Disneyland could have been right here. It could have been right here, and they could have fit one whole roller coaster on it. <laughs> it is pretty small. Compared to where it's yeah, at now. Yeah. So like any good mansion, it needs to be haunted, right? Well, if you just want to be in Savannah and not be haunted, why even be in Savannah? Exactly. Relocate. They say this one is indeed haunted. Remember I told you Samuel and Sarah had six children? I do recall that. Well, during these fancy parties, the children were told to play upstairs. They liked to play with billiard balls, and they were curious and wanted to see what was going on downstairs, so they would accidentally Oops. <laughs> roll the balls down the stairs and then go retrieve them, see what the adults were doing. Well, during one of these nights, one of the littlest girls went to get her ball, and she fell headfirst down the stairs and died. Well, this story got dark real fast. It did. Guests often hear little children laughing in the night, as well as the sound of billiard balls rolling across the wood floors. Like I told you about other bed and breakfasts, it's 21 plus, so there are no children staying there. Creepy. Perhaps they're hearing the spirits of the Hamilton children in happier times. If we go there, we need to take a ball with us and yes. set it in the floor. Maybe a we should do ball. like the RKB Paranormal said on our previous episode and take a little cap ball with a light in it. Oh, yeah. And paint it like a, a billiard, like a billiard ball. ball. We put the number cool. eight on it. Just set or it on seven. the floor. Or it's seven. Lucky. <laughs> Another story associated with the Hamilton Turner Inn is that of a guard spotted on the roof holding a rifle. Remember I told you that Samuel Hamilton was an art collector and he had turned his home into a museum? I do. Well, he had gone to great lengths to protect his investment. He hired a guard to sit on the roof every night with a rifle. Like Gomer? In exactly. The yes, show? yes, yes. One morning when the guard failed to come down from the roof, they went up to check on him and found him dead in a pool of blood. Man, this happened so often in Savannah. <laughs> he had been shot in the back of the head. His murder has never been solved. That's crazy. Samuel couldn't get anyone else to take the job after this, so he would sit on the roof himself, smoking cigars with his rifle, until he died a few months later. How often did they have art thievery in Savannah back then? I know, it's like, why'd they shoot the guy and they didn't steal anything? It sounds almost like this might not have really (laughs) happened. No, I think it did. Hmm. Passersby often see a man on the roof with a rifle and sometimes a cigar. Is this the murdered guard or Samuel Hamilton? Or maybe they're sharing shifts. Yeah, they're just, like, rotating. It's my turn. Yeah. (laughs) There's also a report of a phantom gunshot that was heard back in the late 1960s. At the time, the house was vacant, so no one lived there. But some have said that just because no one lives there doesn't mean someone isn't home. So Ghost City Tours, this is from ghostcitytours.com. Their CEO, Tim Nealon, recalls his own ghostly encounter at the Hamilton Turner Inn. Quote, Almost six years ago, I spent the night at the Hamilton Turner Inn. 
This was pre-Ghost City Tours. I wasn't there looking for ghosts. I simply wanted to stay there. I heard the accommodations were amazing, and I wanted to treat myself for the night. At about two in the morning, I was awoken by the sounds of footsteps walking past my bed. They were very clear and unmistakable. It sounded like someone was walking towards me, laying on the bed. It can be very unnerving to experience this. The I room, imagine. Yeah. The room was very dark, and I couldn't tell if it was an actual person or something else. I laid in bed for a few seconds, and the footsteps stopped. I asked, is anyone here? The paranormal investigator in me started to kick in, as I realized nobody was in the room with me. I didn't get a response, and nothing else happened for the rest of the evening. It sounds like, you know, I would say that I'd get up and run out, but we literally... You would just, like, freeze. We literally had a paranormal experience, yeah. and I didn't leave. Yeah. I, I'm not as scared of it as I thought I was. Well, you were probably just too sleepy to leave. Yeah. <laughs> probably. Author Nancy Roberts writes of her own experience. I wouldn't blame any soul for wanting to return to this wonderful home if they had once lived here. I may just decide to haunt the Hamilton Turner Mansion myself someday. Every time I was there, I got a strong feeling there was something else around. And with the sounds I heard, well, if you think the house is spooky now, try sleeping in it alone when it's dark and vacant and dirty and no one knows you're there and you're trying not to think about the bloody red stain you saw in the closet. (laughs) Actually, it was an adventure and looking back on it now, I feel lucky to have had the honor. She goes on to wonder, what are the chances that I slept in the same spot where the armed guard fell? Is it possible that she did? Maybe, maybe not. But if I've learned one thing about the ghostly Hamilton Turner Inn, more often than not, doubts turn into possibilities. That's probably on their business card. Yeah. (laughs) More often than not, doubts turn into possibilities. So another account is that of a man named Brent Barry. And he went on. Brent Barry? Brent Barry. Brent Barry. He went on record about a time he had experienced paranormal activity in 1969 when he was a 17 year old aircraft mechanic stationed at Hunter Army Airfield. As he related the ghostly tale, he ventured out to Savannah one night, but was broke, so he decided to sleep in the mansion, which was vacant and neglected at the time. What he discovered left chills racing down his spine and goosebumps flaring on his skin. As he explained, the first floor was really dirty, broken glass and debris everywhere, so I went upstairs to the second floor, and it was better, but I just didn't feel right. I went up to the third floor, and it seemed like a good place to sleep, so I found a corner in one of the rooms and laid down. But it didn't take long before he began to hear noises in the mansion and for the true fear to really begin to settle in. At first, I wasn't too concerned. It was an old house, sure to have some creaking and thumping noises. But later in the night or early morning, I started hearing some different kinds of sounds, bumping and some slow squeaking sounds. Now the noises downstairs sounded like they were getting closer to me, like in the stairway. It sounded to me like someone was trying to slowly and quietly sneak up the stairs. Now, I was starting to get a little concerned. Why didn't this guy just sleep on a park bench like the rest of us? Maybe it was cold. He was trapped with nowhere to go except for the narrow stairway that led to the little room on the top of the house. Up I went, and by now, I had a board in my hand, thinking that I may have to use it to defend myself. In the small room, there was very little space, and the door leading out was gone. So out on the roof, I went. The moon was bright, so I watched and waited with the board over my head, ready to swing if I had to. So here I am, a drunk kid from Denver, standing on the roof of a Victorian mansion in Savannah in the middle of the night with a club in my hand. He began asking himself, how in the hell did I get myself into this one? He waited there for a long time, but no one ever came out. Although who he expected to see raised other questions. A, I knew I wasn't going anywhere until daylight, so I just waited there till morning. I didn't get any sleep that night. So, do you think it was maybe just another homeless person coming up the stairs? I think he was stairs? probably just drunk, maybe hearing noises, because we both know that if he had heard real ghost noises, it would have been parties. They should have had children laughing. Little kids laughing. Billiard balls. Billiard balls falling down the stairs. Maybe some British people saying, would you like some old tea? Dumb waiters moving up you and down. You dumb waiter. <laughs> so, I went on TripAdvisor and found some more recent accounts. Susan W. wrote, Beautiful home, expect the supernatural. The first evening we were there, my daughter and I sat in the parlor very late at night and did the whole TV ghost hunters thing and asked if there was anyone with us and if they could please let us know they were. Truly, directly above my daughter's head, on the floor above, we heard two thumps. It scared both of us so much we didn't know what to do. 
That evening, we were staying in the Johnny Mercer room, and for some reason, I remember hearing piano music very early the next morning. All I hear in my mind is the theme song from The Ghost and Mr. Chicken. I remember thinking that it was way too early for them to be piping in music, and to be honest, not very good music at that. Don't you talk about The Ghost and Mr. Chicken. When I woke later and went to breakfast, I asked our hostess which room had been the music room when the house was built and lived in originally. She did have to go and ask, but however, when she came back, she said that it was our room. So she heard piano music and there was no music coming on. Uh Uh-oh. Sounds (laughs) ghostly to me. Style Traveler 1967 wrote, Perfect place for our first trip to Savannah. Firstly, let me say that I do believe in ghosts and paranormal activity, but my mom does not. On our second night, we went to bed talking about the inn's haunted past, and my mom said that she didn't want to see any. I laughed and said, well, I do. You can visit me, ghosts. Ah, that's famous last words. And with that, we went to sleep. I was awoken in the middle of the night, I'm guessing around 2 to 3 a.m., to a young child crying, and then a muffled woman's voice obviously trying to console the child. From the cry, you could tell the child wasn't a baby, but he wasn't 10 years old either. I'm guessing probably a toddler. The sound came from above us, and since we were on the first floor, I put it down to another guest upstairs who had a child with them and went back to sleep. And then the next morning, they find out they don't allow children. Uh Uh-oh. So. Ghostly activity. Yeah. (laughs) The following story comes from Afterlife Tours. The Johnny Mercer room, or room 202, at the Hamilton Turner Inn frequently leaves guests with strange experiences. Prior to his investigation of the bed and breakfast, Ryan Dunn, the owner of Afterlife Tours and founder of the Savannah Ghost Research Society, caught up with the inn's concierge, Tim O'Birne, to hear his experiences. O'Birne had been in room 202 one morning and had opened the armoire where an ironing board and iron set set inside. Upon exiting the room... Tim heard a loud thud from behind him. When he turned around and re-entered the room, the ironing board and the iron had been that had been in the closet were now set up and sitting in the middle of the floor. Get to ironing, says the ghost. <laughs> he said, yeah, wrinkled, son. A we couple- got parties to have. You can't come in here at your wrinkly shirt. Exactly. A couple who had been on one of Dunn's afterlife tours also later recalled to him their strange experience at the inn. All on my tour, I had explained to the couple how you use a smartphone and the voice recorder app to capture an EVP. Read this as older folk. Yeah. They decided to turn on their phone and record and set it on the nightstand while they slept. Late into the night, all of a sudden, there was a sound of a jack-in-the-box slowly cranking. Okay, I don't buy that. As the sound of the music became louder and louder, there was a sudden sound of it popping out of the box. Afterward, there was an unexplainable male voice that whispered, Shh, it's almost morning. This sounds almost like it's a fabricated story to me. Well, what if he heard the recording? Then it could have been staged. Well, I think it's probably true. Because we should this stay place in this is room just, yes, this and place take a jack in the box with us. <laughs> crawling with ghosts, and I want to stay there. Make we'll, a reservation. We'll do it. Okay. All right, that brings us to the point where we like to insert graphic here. What we're watching. So this week, I got to pick the movie as long as I promised that it would be comedy horror. So I went to the trusty Shudder app. Sponsor us, Shudder. Please. Please. To find something to fit the bill. And I managed to find something completely insane. You did. So it worked out well. We watched the 2019 horror comedy, Here Comes Hell. (laughs) This movie is made to feel like an old-timey movie and is in black and white. Somehow you thought it was in color. (laughs) I watched it, and then today I was writing about it, and for some reason I vividly remember seeing, like, the red bow tie on a guy. No. But it was all in black and white. It was all in black and white. So it appears that my mind is proof that eyewitness testimony is not trustworthy. 
You learned that from previous true crime episodes. I did. And like I saw a thing the other day, I forgot to tell you when I was watching the about the cursed movies and they did an experiment and they're like, they had some basketball players on a court and some of them were wearing black jerseys and some of them were wearing white and they're like concentrating on counting how many are wearing white. And so you're doing that. And while you're doing that, then they say, okay, now count how many people are wearing black. And then they replay it again, and they're like, how many people saw the gorilla? And a literal person dressed as a gorilla walked right through the middle of these people throwing the basketball back and forth, and you didn't see it. Wow. Did you? I did not see it. You didn't see it. Because your brain is so focused on one thing. That sounds like me in every instance. Yeah, so you can definitely miss something. So even the soundtrack from this movie is reminiscent of old-timey movies. I really like the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. They really never tell you specifically when it's set, but it feels like it's from the 30s is what the feeling that the yeah, movie gives you. that's what I would One guess. One of those old talky kind of movies. Yeah. So the premise of the movie is that a group of upper class friends are getting together at a house one of them recently purchased, Westwood Manor. They meet up for drinks. And they pretty much drink constantly throughout this entire movie. Yeah, you know how, like, when you pour wine into a glass, you're supposed to, like, you fill it up like that yeah. much. Well, the guy was, like, filling it up to the Charge brim. your glass. And, like, and, like, sipping a little bit up, pouring some more. I'm like, that. They drink more than the people on Tybee They Island drink, do, like, Savannah Tybee. Which is not humanly possible, yeah. <laughs> which is why this has to be a complete yeah. fabricated movie. Yeah, they would fit right in here. It's then, after they have their libations, that the (laughs) owner of the house tells them about the entertainment that he's lined up for them. A seance. Fun. A medium comes to visit them and starts the seance. They're all very much like, oh, what is this? What's going on? But one of the people in the party is like, we don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. We don't need to mess around with these forces we don't understand. Mm -hmm. The only person with sense. Yeah. The owner of the house, who is the host of the party, says that he's recently gotten into the paranormal and that this house was actually previously owned by a leader of the paranormal who was close to unlocking something big. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, the seance goes horribly awry (laughs) and everything goes completely nuts from that point forward. Yeah, it went off the rails. The medium gets possessed and tells them they're all going to die, not make it to morning, and further on and further on. And then they realize that they've unleashed something, hence the title, Here Comes Hell. So, Crystal, (laughs) tell me what you think about this movie, and please give me your rating based on the 1 to 12 arbitrarily chosen dog treat rating system. I actually will give it a 10 because I really liked it. It was really funny and lighthearted, in a, even though it was horror. It was very low budget. It too. was very low budget, which I really appreciate. Which sort of worked out. The runtime was great. It was like an hour and 17 minutes-ish. And I just, I like, the characters were funny, and the whole thing was just so cheesy, which I love. And it was, I love the old style of the movie. It was made, like, when they're driving the car, and it's like, Clearly the fake the guy's background. hands doing yeah. this. And the, and the background's like shaking. Yeah. And you know they did that on purpose. Oh, yeah. And yeah, it, yeah. it was hilarious. Yeah, I really liked it. You so did a good job. 10 out of 12. 10 out of 12. I did a pretty good job. Yeah, you picked well this time. So my review of this movie is I'm going to go ahead and give this movie a 10 and a half. Oh, you just have to out, out of 12 me. because I always like to just have a little Get a bit one up extra. Me. Yes, I do like to one up <laughs> you when, when possible. When possible, I do. Oh, God. The setting of the movie is great. I love the the sequences they shot. Like we said, it's a low-budget movie, but that doesn't make it any less entertaining. It's clearly meant to be ridiculous, yeah. over-the-top stuff. There's a scene in this movie that I couldn't find a, a clip of to share with oh, you. Oh, couldn't. But there's a man who is affected by what's going on in the house, and somehow <laughs> his hand is replaced with a small Tyrannosaurus Rex head. <laughs> And that's really all I need to say. That alone made the movie worth it. It was like one of those grabber things, like you squeeze in the little mouth, but it's his hand. It was was, was so out there. It was definitely something I would have come up with. Yes. Watch this movie. Yes. Ten and a half out of 12 for me. It's on the great Shudder app. Sponsor a Shudder? Sponsor a Shudder. (laughs) So that's going to bring us to the portion of the show that we like to call... Layla and 
and Coffee Talk. So, Crystal, we both know what went on this week with Layla and Coffee. They've gotten into this phase now where they think they're going to go for walks. Yeah. Layla is persistent when she wants something, so she goes over to where her leashes hang, and she'll, like, growl at you sort of, like, well, not growl, but, like, indicate oh. that oh. she wants you to put her leash on her. And she's very, very well behaved when you go to put the leash on. She'll just stand there. She'll step. It's a harness, so she'll step right into it. Coffee, on the other hand, turns into a whirling dervish when she sees it coming, and she's, like, flailing around the room. She's knocking the hardware off our chest of drawers. She's, literally. Yeah, literally. And she's like just everywhere. Biting the leash. Biting. Jumping. I literally have to get her in a headlock and lay on her while you put her little gentle lead on her. And she's crying the whole yeah, time. Yeah, she's crying with excitement. Not because she's being held down. She's crying because she just can wait to get out the door. Yeah, so last night on their walk, we encountered a black lab who was bigger than Layla. And Coffee thought she might try to pick a fight with her or him. <laughs> so yeah. it, I don't know if it was a boy or girl, but so if Layla were to decide were to decide to try to go after something, I couldn't stop her. No. So it's a good thing that she's much more like reserved. And she's she, much more of an elephant <laughs> than, than coffee. If you just tell her to leave it and no, she'll just keep walking. She'll cry about she'll, it. But she'll, she'll, she'll whine a little bit, but she won't go after it. What she goes after is small woodland creatures. She yeah. saw something. I don't know what it was. Chipmunk, mouse. Rabbit, rabbit something. We used we, to have a bunch of rabbits yeah. on the island, and then all the hawks ate them. Yeah, I couldn't see what it was. It was just moving around in some tall grass, and she saw that and nearly pulled my arm out of its socket before I told her no. If she had noticed it was a small dog, she would have been terrified. Oh, yeah, she would have just been terrified. So, like we said last week was Mother's Day, and I sent my mom a wisdom panel dog DNA test, like we used on Coffee and Layla. Yeah. And, uh, she has a dog named Buddy, and we're going to show you a picture of him. And so I think he's, I can see Beagle. I have learned that you can't tell by looking at a you dog can't. what it is, so I'm going to say that this is a Pomeranian. <laughs> An old Pomeranian? A Pomeranian. Okay, so when she gets the test results, we'll give you all the breakdown because we're not sure what it is. Pomeranian. Pomeranian. Wharf rat. No, that's coffee. I don't care. These tests are rigged. She's a wharf rat, and you know it, and I know it, and she knows it. So that's just how it is. Also, their bark box has not been delivered yet. It's been several days since I said that it was shipped. So hopefully it'll be here. Where's my bark box? Yeah. Before the next episode, we will have the bark box and let you know what they thought of the Star Wars edition, which is what I'm assuming they're getting this month. I hope so. Yeah. Like lightsaber toys. Oh, that would be fun. It would be fun. So you can find us online at ScarySavannahAndBeyond.com. You can find us on all social media platforms if you look for the user at Scary Savannah. Please go check us out on Patreon. We have a weekly series that we're releasing, and they have audio and video options available. It's Patreon.com forward slash Scary Savannah. For as little as $3 a month, you can help support the podcast and get extra content. We're ta currently talking about cryptids from A to Z which would yeah. be the States it's from A to Z. Fun. And I think you would enjoy that. So check that out. Please also remember to look at our merchandise giveaway. We give out a shirt like this, size and color optional, and a coffee mug like the Layla and Coffee Talk mug or our original Scary Savannah logo <laughs> mug. Go to our website, click on the giveaway tab, and you can enter in for that. Also, if you go to our merchandise tab, there's a store tab. We have shirts, hats, and all kinds of cool stuff that would also help support the podcast. If you want to buy my lovely co-host a coffee and replace this nasty junk that <laughs> I'm drinking, you can find a little icon on the bottom right hand of your web browser that looks like that. If you click on that, you can donate to her coffee fund. And you, Brett's this time. He's, yeah, he's not feeling this. It's nasty. I feel, I feel violated. So I opened it and I took a sip and I'm like, yeah, this is kind of weird. And I it gave it to you. It gets worse the and longer like, it sits mm, out. I like it. So I was like, okay, well, you it can have that. It was okay at first <laughs> and it just has gone downhill since. But so you're going to pour it out or are you just going to drink it anyway? I usually drink stuff even if I don't like oh, it. But so I'm it's thinking that bad. I'm going to pour this out. That bad. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to And take we got it. a hole and that's not even open yet. Yeah, maybe we can palm that off on one of our kids. Yeah, they don't like coffee. Oh, maybe we can just burn it. <laughs> If you'd like to leave us a message, we'd love to hear from you about anything. If you look at the bottom 
right hand corner of your web browser, you'll see an icon you can click and you can directly leave us a message. We'll play it on the show or not. You know, we'd love to hear from you about anything. You can also give us a call on our traditional phone line, which is 912-406-2899. 912-406-2899. That goes directly to voicemail. Please give us a call with any kind of story ideas, corrections, or if you are in fact related to Big Savannah. Also, there's a tab on our website to ask us anything. Send us questions. I don't care what it's about. It can be about the show or it can be about Savannah or it can be about any other topic you want to talk about. We'd love to have questions from you and we'll answer them to the best of our ability. Yeah, once we get enough questions, we're going to do an episode of Q&A. And we definitely would love to do that soon. So please, doesn't matter what it is, we'd love to see your questions. Go to the website. You can easily enter that and send it to us. I believe that's going to leave that one last thing, though. Join us next time in Savannah, where the ghosts and the good times live on. But you know who don't? Uh, Hampton Lily Bridge. Uh, apparently not. Sounds like he's got to go play pool with them folks that's hiding upstairs with the bat they're trying to hit the intruders with. And the ghost on the top of the roof with the rifle and the cigarettes or cigars. I don't know. Let's go check it out. You want to? Big Savannah. We're going to Big Savannah. Okay. <laughs>